Is Senator Nichols, is it 1115 you have to leave? I just, yeah. there's, because you have two minutes here. I'd just like Absolutely. to. Absolutely. Senator Schumer ask you the question about the constitutional option. And, and you're a lawyer, is that correct? No. Oh, you're not? You, no. Okay, okay. Well, no wonder you evaded the question <laughs> then. This, but I, I would you think have would an be opinion? A... I mean, he basically was asking. He, he, you know, he gave a hypothetical, and, and uh, Senator Bennett said he wouldn't stipulate it to, to it. But the problem we have today that you're, that, that you're describing, and you said it very well, you know, you, you said several times, there are way too many filibusters. That's your quote filibusters being used too many times. I mean, that's what we're seeing over and over again. And, and to change that, the key is, as Vice President Mondale said, is to be able to move with 51 votes and be able to do it as a majority under the Constitution. Do you have an opinion as on, on that? You know, the Constitution says it. Article 1, Section 5, each House may determine the rules of its proceedings. If and And the vote by 51 votes at the beginning of a Congress. I mean, they, do you have an opinion on that? Yes, I think it would be a disaster if you did it. Well, uh, no, they do, but can you do it? I, well, one, you're continuous. You, you still are operating the rules under the, it's a continuous body. You don't have 100% of the Senate. So your answer is then no, I think. That would be correct. Yeah, yeah okay. I, I can give you a longer answer. Body. No, no, I don't need a longer <laughs> answer. I know, because yeah, it's 1115. I want to let you go. Okay, so I, I just want, I wanted to try to see if I could get an answer from you directly. But I understand the continuous, not to cut you off and not to be impolite in any way. I want to let you leave at 1115. I appreciate you, that. You Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, thank you, Chairman Schumer, very much. And, and uh, before I ask the Vice President a couple of questions, I just want to say a few things. Today, to, to me, today's hearing is not about examining the current use of the filibuster, but the abuse of the filibuster. Uh, we would not need to examine the filibuster if it were used sparingly and judiciously, as Senator uh, Nichols talked about. Unfortunately, both parties in recent years have shown their willingness to use it as a tool of obstruction rather than a means to extend debate. One of the main reasons I ran for the Senate is because I saw the world's greatest deliberative body turning into a graveyard of good ideas. After over a year of observing this body in action, or in many cases, lack of action, it's clear that we're in danger of becoming just that. Last month, this committee held its first hearing on the filibuster. It focused on the evolution of the filibuster throughout the history of the Senate. At that hearing, several of my senior colleagues on the other side of the aisle spoke about the need to preserve the filibuster in its current form. They argued that it, it, it is embedded in the Senate's tradition of unlimited debate, that any attempt to reform it is simply a short-sighted power grab by a frustrated majority. But I believe my colleagues are missing the point. I've been speaking for months about reforming the Senate rules, not just the filibuster, to make this a better institution. I'm not approaching this effort with disrespect for this body's traditions. I hope that by reforming our rules, can, we can restore some of the collegiality and bipartisanship that our founders intended for the Senate. And let me make clear, I don't necessarily think that the current three-fifths requirement to achieve cloture is wrong. What is wrong is that only three current members of the Senate, Senator Byrd, Senator Inouye, and Senator Leahy, have had the opportunity to vote on Rule 22, which was last changed in 1975. What is truly wrong with our rules is that they have become entrenched against change something our founders never intended. I'm very happy, Vice President Mondale, to see you here today because you were one of the leaders of filibuster reform back in 1975. And I know you believe, as I do, that each Senate has the constitutional right to change its rules by a majority vote. And you state that very clearly in your testimony. The Senate of 1975 thought that the filibuster was being abused. But the more recent Senates have demonstrated a whole new level of obstruction with senators from both sides of the aisle increasingly using it as a weapon of partisan warfare. 
It's time to reform our rules. And as I've said many times, I will hold this view whether I'm a member of the majority or the minority. There are many great traditions in this body that should be kept and respected, but stubbornly clinging to ineffective and unproductive procedures should not be one of them. Now, Vice President Mondale. Great, and thank you. Yeah. And now you may ask your question. Th thank you, Senator Schumer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Vice President uh, Mondale, you heard Senator Nichols talk about the idea that this, this, any change in the filibusters is going to dramatically change the Senate, that the Senate isn't, uh, Senate's going to become like the House. And, and we heard this in our last hearing. Several critics of filibuster reform have stated that if the Senate changed the cloture rule, changed it in any way, uh, it would make the Senate no different than the House of Representatives. Um, as a former member of this body, how would you respond to that assertion in terms of your experience that you, uh, you went through and what you observe today with regard to the Senate? I don't want the Senate to become the House. I want it to be the uh, unique body that uh, it has always been. And I agree uh, with you on that. When, uh, when we adopted these rules in 75, reducing the number needed for cloture, what we heard from the opposition was just that, that you're going to change the Senate away from what it's been. And now today what I'm hearing is 60 is just about right. Well, that, that's a transformation of viewpoint uh, uh, from what we heard uh, back then. I think uh, the rules have been changed since the beginning of this Senate. Uh, at first, there were no, uh, no filibustering going on. Then they went to the, uh, they were just the previous, move the previous question. Then there were several decades where um, uh, there was no way of closing off debate. And then in the middle of World War I, when Wilson couldn't get the Senate to even supply materials to fight the war, he gave a bitter speech and the Senate bent and adopted the, the two-thirds rule. And then it came to our time and we were paralyzed. We, we couldn't get anything done uh, unless uh, uh, everyone agreed to it. And so we changed the rule by a big part bipartisan, a broad cross-section of support. Because of the rulings of Vice President Rockefeller, we changed the rules to, to what they are now. And I think that worked for us. It worked for us in those times. But what we have now is a harsh partisanship that scholars, uh, they're gonna testify, um, I know later here, and they say that the situation now is in terms of uh, abuse of power, in terms of paralysis, this is worse than it's, and different than it's ever been. And I believe that's true. The number of filibusters that were cited in the charts thrown before, the, um, the use of holes, which we haven't discussed enough today, well, that's, it's been done before, but the pervasiveness of the strategy of holds now holds up hundreds of nominations. Government can't get, get going. Numbers, uh, any numbers of uh, uh, measures, uh, often the holds are submitted secretly. Uh, there's rolling holds, all kinds of holds now. And the net effect is that uh, they're able, through secrecy, to uh, block the Senate from action without any public accountability. And the, they were able to do that because just behind that hold is the threat of a filibuster. And a leader knows he can't make any progress into those. And so I think that, that we need to adjust the rules, not to become the House, but to become a restored, effective Senate with the power to deliberate so we can do our jobs and do them better. Let me, um, you, talk, you, you said we haven't talked enough about holes. I mean, one of the result of holes, and, and you know this observing us yeah. uh, currently, um, the, the, I believe as the Washington Post reported, it, it, at the, after the first year, the Obama administration had been in office for a year, they only had 55% right. of their appointees in place. So basically you have 
uh, the hold process holding up the administration from getting its team in place. That was, wasn't what was ever envisioned, I think, no. by our founders or by the Constitution. It, it, it's, it's, um, it's been completely abused. What, what would you suggest in terms of if you were going to make a rule change about holes specifically? And what, could you talk to us a little yeah. bit about what, that? What I said in the, uh, my testimony was that I think the leader ought to be able to move uh, to proceed and it should be a majority vote, maybe with a certain time limit for the debate, but it shouldn't be, in effect, filibuster. And I'm talking about how you get the measure up for consideration. I'm not talking about how it's finally resolved. The regular rules would apply to that. Yeah. Many times we've seen on these holds that they're held up, and then when it finally gets to a filibuster vote, or a final vote on the nominee, they pass 98 to 2 or something like that. So it, it was apparently a false issue. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for allowing me to run a little bit over there. No, it was well worth Actually, it. Actually, with his answer. Thank you, Chairman.